Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm so excited because I've only met Rob recently, but today we've got Rob Stevenson on the end of the line. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's so I, I love it when I can meet someone and then within a week or two, like uh, rope them in and uh, schedule in uh, a conversation. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. So, so Rob and I met at a joint sort of uh, workplace well-being mental health event. Uh, we both spoke, so he got to hear a little bit of my story. I got to hear a little bit of his. Um, he's a he's a speaker, a consultant, living with a mental health condition, and I really love how you're innovating in this space. So there's so many. Uh, you, you're just really trying to up the profile of the positive end of of authenticity and vulnerability, and just showing up as our true selves. So I was like, I've got to get Rob on the show. Um, so, so fill in the blanks for our listeners. What are the things that you're most excited and passionate about at the moment? Well, thanks, uh, Petra. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's great to talk to you on this, uh, this platform. Um, I would describe myself as a mental health influencer and campaigner um, tied together by trying to create mentally healthier workplaces. For me, I experienced bipolar disorder. Uh, I was diagnosed quite late when I was about 30. I'm 47 now. And I think for a lot, of, like a lot of people, I learned to manage my condition, but did so under the radar with only close friends and family knowing about it. And for me, that was because of stigma and a fear that people would perceive me differently. And my light bulb moment came by uh, listening to Jeff McDonald speak um, okay. at a lunchtime presentation. And Jeff was talking about his experiences of anxiety and depression. And I sat there in the audience feeling shame. And I felt shame because there I was, a successful business owner with you know, great people around me, supportive, supportive team. And yet every week I would put the word physio in my diary when I would go and see my therapist for years. My team must have thought I've got the worst physiotherapist in the world <laughs> that could not fix this back injury. It's like yet, a chronic condition. <laughs> absolutely. And yet I was coming in on Mondays telling tales of 100-mile bike rides. It felt dishonest. Um, and I was really motivated to become open. I could see that there was this movement of breaking stigma. So decided to do that, but also thought, how could I contribute to the movement? Um, so my main initiative is a social enterprise called Inside Out. Um, and Inside Out was formed to really try and solve the problem that we do not have enough of our senior leaders who are you know, open, sharing their lived experience of mental ill health and acting as role models. So we published our first leaderboard for 2019, uh, and I'm really delighted with this. There are 42 senior leaders from our workplaces who are have put their name to the list um, to really set an example that there are people in leadership positions who are being open about their mental health challenges, um, and we need more to follow suit. 100%. So the people on the list, uh, do they all have a mental health condition in the same way as you've got bipolar, or... Um, is that sort of the criteria for, for showing up on this list? Yeah, the, there are 41 on the list that, that have a direct uh, mental ill health challenge. And there's a range of conditions in there. There's uh, some of the more common mental illnesses, anxiety and depression. But there is you know, PTSD. There are borderline personality disorder. There are the effects of even more harrowing conditions like child abuse and how that has affected mental health. Mm. Um so there's a, there's a whole range of conditions on there. Um, there was one role model we included whose experience came from, from his wife. Um, and it was quite a powerful story about how she then motivated, motivated him to be a champion in his workplace for both, both both mental ill health, but also the Asian community and, and the intersection between mm. mental ill health and that community, because that's a whole different story of stigma as well. But yes, the majority, 41, have got direct experience of mental ill health. And um, as you know, in my mental health consultancy role, it's so powerful and makes such a difference to any initiatives or training or things that we do when we've got people at the top who lead by example in, in this openness. And a lot of our training is, is very much how can we have empathy, but also have boundaries? How can we have productivity and have openness and transparency? There's this fear that it's one or the other, right? Um, yeah. But I think you're also saying that and recognizing that work is changing, the, the consciousness of, of people in the world, are, are, we're kind of moving towards something. I think we, there, there definitely is a movement to um, change workplace cultures. Um, 
but we are in the foothills of that movement. So we're just starting out. But I think anybody that speaks out about mental ill health is a role model and creates a ripple of more people than thinking it's okay to talk about mental illness. But when our senior leaders talk, speak out, something really cool happens. It gives people permission to seek help for their own mental ill health challenges, but it starts to stimulate culture change and move the narrative away from just mental ill health and helping people that are struggling to mental health and well-being and helping everybody in, in the workplace. It's more of a prevention and, conversation and one of connection and support, right? To, to yeah. avoid burnout and, and just enhance our happiness at work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the most powerful case studies I've seen from the 42 are when actually workplace cultures have transformed to allow everybody to do things in the working week to balance the stress of the workplace to maximize their well-being. And, and what do we get? We get happier yet more productive workplaces. And that's the real powerful bit about senior leaders, I think. So powerful. Um, so so get, let's go go back because I'm already quite um, curious and fascinated by the fact that you got diagnosed quite late in life. So already as an, an adult. Um, but traditionally, uh, these sorts of symptoms can come out right from sort of the teenage years. Um, what was it like? growing up um what was the stigma or context like when it came to mental health and did you even know that that was a question to ask yourself if anything was showing up so it's a really good question so absolutely i can see the signs of my mental illness through to late teens and through my 20s okay um i tell the story of my first year at university about being in my halls of residence and there was a kind of knock at the door and i froze and under the covers it was about 7 p.m., and I prayed that the people could not come into the room. And eventually they walked away. But the funny thing was, it was two of my best friends who had agreed to pick me up at the, agree, you know, the agreed time. And, and I couldn't face them, and I did not know why. And I now know it's because I was experiencing depression. Mm. And I can see the signs of it through that 10-year period of my 20s where I was either the life and soul of the party, the center of attention, and totally exuberant through to not being able to face people. And I just thought I was different. I thought that was me. And that is the case. I was different. Now I've got a label of bipolar disorder and I could have, I could have sought help a bit earlier, but I didn't, I wasn't aware enough to know that I needed to seek help until um, around my 30th birthday when I was out of my workplace for three weeks, not being able to function with depression. But the signs were certainly there throughout my late teens and, and my 20s. And in hindsight, did friends or parents or siblings, I don't know if you've got siblings, were, 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 did people notice? Were, were they saying, like, perhaps something needs to happen? Or were you just really good, like I was, on putting the mask in front of myself when I was out in the world and crumbling sort of behind closed doors? Yeah, absolutely. The mask you mention is it's really important, you know, because... I would hide the depression that I was feeling, and then I would live off the mania that I was ex exhibiting. Um, so I wanted people to perceive me as this fun-loving, outgoing guy that was could achieve things, could get things done, that could win at sport, that could pass exams. And then the other bit of me, I hid uh, behind mm. those closed doors, and I was afraid that people would see it. But it's really funny. I look back and think, why did I not understand that that is, is not normal or not usual behavior? I think it's because it was just intrinsically a part of me. Mm. But it, there was some bit of it that I thought, I can't show this to people. So I hid it. And yeah, I hid it pretty well. Um, and, you know, we can do that. But I think we do it at a real cost to ourselves. So that pressure of, trying to be something you're not, particularly in a, when you're in a period of depression, just adds this weight to you. And it's a weight you carry and you get used to carrying. And I don't know if you feel the same, but since being open, I felt lighter. I felt lifted. I felt liberated. Um, and that, for me, is the biggest benefit of being open about our mental ill health challenges. You just don't have the added pressure or weight of a secret and and you mentioned fear, and I'm I'm taking the assumption from my own work um, that it's fear of judgment, it's fear of not belonging, it's fear that if we you know say these things out loud, maybe it's worse than we thought. I don't know. What was the fear for you that kept you stuck in shame? 
fear it was a fear that people would perceive me differently. So again, I tell the story of a, a partner uh, at uh, one of the accounting firms that I used to do some work for in my recruitment business, and and I remember going to a meeting and doing the classic thing of being in tears in the bathroom before then needing to put the the game face on to meet him um, uh, about some business we were doing. And then I later, when I was open, met the same partner and told him that, look, you might see some stuff on me on LinkedIn. I'm being, I'm being very open and vocal about bipolar disorder. And he said, oh, yeah, my brother-in-law suffers from that. And I, uh, I had a period of depression this, 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 uh, this year that I was open about in the workplace. And I was blown away by this. So the, the person I was fearful of that would perceive me differently actually could empathize completely. And all of a sudden, after years of business conversations, we connected on this real human level about our shared experience of mental ill health. Um, but you're right, it was a fear of being perceived differently, a fear that people wouldn't want to work for me, work with me, give me their business, think I was weak, all of that stuff. But let's be real here. There is a lot of stigma in the world. There is a lot of misunderstanding. Not every leader will be able to, to sort of meet you in the middle and have, be open about their experience. We're privileged to be in spaces where that's trying to change. But um, sometimes there is ignorance. And there is yep. the media that portrays these things in a, in a way that is, you know, you won't be as capable or you're now going to take sick leave or, or things like that. But then I also know that openness, like it, more than anything else for me, connection and openness set me on the path to recovery. But talk me through this sort of, I don't know, did you have a rock bottom moment? What led you in your 30s to, to kind of beginning to share because sometimes it's from a place of desperation that we're like fuck it there's no other way forward other than just being open what have i got to lose something like that what was that little time like yeah so my, my lowest point was when i was 31 and when i was diagnosed i was initially diagnosed with depression which later became a bipolar 2 as it was then diagnosis um and for me, this was then I thought, great, I can be fixed. You know, I'm in the medical profession. I can, there's a label for this negative stuff that I'm feeling. They can give me a pill. I can see a therapist. And for a while, I was fixed. For about six months, okay. I was better. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, great, you know, yeah. the medical profession has mended me. Yeah. I'm whole again. And then it came back. But this time when, when the depression came back, it came back with a loss of hope. Mm. A loss of hope that I would ever be better. And with that loss of hope, I then entered my darkest period. And when I was 31, I tried to end my life. And I did that because I felt it was futile. I felt I felt that actually I was always going to have to be living with this burden of depression, which in one respect is true. But in another respect, actually, I learned to accept that condition to accept there would be periods where uh, I would feel low or depressed but I also learned that those periods would pass um, and with that acceptance came an ability to manage um, so you know, and that's how I think a lot of us would describe it we manage our condition and we manage the, the the low times we manage the times where we're dangerously high but we also then learn to love the bits in the middle so for me yeah, you know, we don't talk enough about the strengths of our neurodiversity. And for me, there are times in my cycle that I'm highly creative, I'm highly driven, I can challenge the impossible, I can get a lot done. And yeah, those those bits define the real strengths of me. Now I wouldn't get that without the lows and the highs. So mm -hmm. I think that it, it's about an understanding and learning from that low point of what works for me to manage and try and stay in that middle zone. Um, and over the years, that's, that's, that's helped. But for me, it's things like exercise, it's things like mindfulness, it is social connection, it's connecting with family you know, and friends and having that meaningful discussion about where we're at. It's giving myself a score out of 10 every day to watch for trends. So today I'm a seven and a half. You know, I'd probably be an eight if I was sleeping a bit more at the moment. But if I'm a six, five, then I'm wondering, okay, what do I need to do to stop myself being a four? Because if I'm a four, I'm in bed for a few days with depression. So it's that self-awareness. 
Um, but I think it was from that low point and the realization that actually accepting that I was going to experience negativity and negative feelings and learning to cope with that, that really helped. And I love what you're saying about almost the blessing of it, because you're right. We don't think about that enough. We think I'm doing my mission in life and I have to do it with this burden of something, right? When actually, so, so I'm very much an, an addict and an alcoholic and in recovery for the last 11 years. Um, and I know that my obsession with alcohol, which led me to the brink of death, is also the obsession that can allow me to create amazing amounts of impact and joy and purpose and, you know, in the world. And so I've, I've become, I've come to learn to almost be grateful or to the, the whole theme of this podcast is how can our worst adversity, our worst rock bottom actually be our superpower? So the thing that can propel us forward to fully live our mission. And so it's a total flip on this idea that we're broken. I mean, you said yeah. that thing about being fixed and stuff, but I, as a clinician, I don't quite like the, the idea that we're broken. It's like we're just made differently and have a different purpose in the world. I don't know what you think. I, I agree completely. And I, I, I love the, I love the superpower term. I, I'm starting to use that term that bipolar is my superpower. I know Kanye West is perhaps not going to be the greatest role <laughs> model in all aspects of life, but does talk about his bipolar as his superpower. And for me, that is the case. Uh, I wouldn't achieve half of the things that I achieve without my condition. And I think you are right. We are starting to think less about being broken and less about labeling people and more about thinking everybody is somewhere on the mental health continuum. We all have mental health and we're all different. We're all different in, 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 in slightly unique ways. You know, I might oscillate much more on that continuum than yeah. the average person, which is true. Um, but Without that oscillation, I wouldn't get the drive, the creativity that I have, and I wouldn't achieve what I achieve. So I think it's more around now focusing on the fact we all have mental health. That's a fact. We all are somewhere on that continuum. We can all improve our mental health wherever we are, and we all have strengths and, and, and limiting factors on that continuum. So for me, the depression is a limiting factor. The creativity, the drive, the challenging the impossible is definitely a superpower. And yeah. I had a conversation with Alistair Campbell about the big red button. So if you had the opportunity to press the big red button and become normal and not experience depression yeah. uh, and not experience mania, would you press it? And you know, Alistair experiences clinical depression. I experience bipolar. And we both concluded that we would not press that button because actually whilst I would do anything to get out of the period of depression when I'm in it, I wouldn't give up the superpowers. That is fascinating. Um, and, I, and it made me question, I think I kind of cringed visibly, thinking, would I press the button? Would I press the button? Um, and, and the reason I cringe is not because of the what it gives me now, which is less of an extreme continuum, because I simply don't drink, and that quiets the voices in my head, um, but because of the dark, dark, dark couple of years that I had which were dark and dangerous and bad for my kids and horrific, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, I know that I had to go through that in order to be strong enough, focused enough, um, able to listen and have empathy, like all those amazing skills and qualities. Yeah. So my life wouldn't be what it is um, yeah. if, I, if I sort of gave that up. Um, there's also something to, say, to be said about just the time that we're living in as far as technology, as far as the fast pace, as far as 70% more children and young people are experiencing conditions like statistics are all over the place, right? Um, do you think that technology, I'm just going to get geeky with you for a second. Do you think technolo technology is impacting our mental health in a negative way? I think my view on technology is that it can um, be the scapegoat for our problems in society. Um, so yes, I think the way we communicate, um, the way we want to be liked on social media channels, um, the way that that's taking us away from the outside and, and playing games together as children will clearly have an impact on, on, on our mental well-being. I think social media in, in itself could be a force for good. So I was having a conversation with Carl Simons of Thames Water. And so there, internal social media, the, YAM, the Yammer pages that they use, 
is basically used to reinforce people to like what they're doing, to be a, a real positive force um, for workplace interactions. And because actually people have accountability going on that platform, there's no negativity, there's no trolls, there's obviously it's a workplace it's system. Safe, yeah. So I think in that situation, it's a force for good. In wider society where people feel they have no filter and can be the worst of themselves on, on, on the platform, I think it's a force for bad. For me, the I think the real problem is loss of human connection. So our society, we're, we're not so community focused. We're more transient. Um, we are communicating electronically and digitally more than verbally increasingly. And I think it's that loss of human connection that is causing the rise of common um, common mental illnesses called, uh, around depression and anxiety. Stigma is also getting broken, so that means more people are talking about common mental illnesses as well, though. So you, I think you've got to factor that into the, the stats too. So digital is here. We're not going to get away no. from it. I think it's how we're interacting with it and how we're using it as a society, for me, that is the problem. Yeah, and we need to consciously make decisions and create our own balance in all of these things, right? Um, yeah. But before we started recording, we were just talking about our own levels of, you know, stress or burnout and like um, pushing really hard to do amazing things that we really love doing, but how yeah. that can kind of affect us in different ways. Um, obviously, you have a great system that you've worked out over the years to help you l understand or look after your own mental health. Um, but I think we were both kind of going, sometimes we know it all, but we don't actually do it. And it's still, it's not a perfect road, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What's what's that? Just talk me through like the, 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 the messy middle. What's the reality like for you on a daily basis? Yeah. Well, I think like a lot of um, people who have found their purpose, and this could be a purpose in doing good. It could be in you know, purpose as a an entrepreneur or a startup. You, know, you are so driven that you want to achieve things that you can compromise your own well-being as a, as a result. Now, you and I have needed to work out what works for us in managing mental well-being. Yeah. We are very self-aware because of our challenges and because of our conditions. Yeah. So I know that I need to prioritize sleep. I need to get exercise four or five times a week and do a whole bunch of other stuff to manage my well-being. Now, for me, I've been so busy and, and so driven that I've compromised on sleep a little bit. And you have a family, right? You have kids. I do, and... I do have a family, yeah. yes. It was my little boy's fifth birthday party, which didn't affect my, uh, my, my, my also affected my sleep in uh, making all sandwiches and flowers and all of that. <laughs> um, but so, yes, I've got a young family, and it's important that, that they're not compromising because compromised because of my passion. Um, so sometimes you can sacrifice the things that you know affect your your own well-being but you and i are self-aware enough to know when we're doing that and so we can see the signs that actually we need to back off a little bit and find some time to recover i think a lot of people are not self-aware because unless you've experienced a condition a challenge then you often haven't worked out what you need to do to look after your mental well-being you know, we know about physical health, we know about nutrition, we know in society we should brush our teeth, we know about dental health. But mental health, we haven't worked on to the same level of, uh, of, of uh, the same degree as we've been growing up. Mm. And so I think when it comes to your average person with average mental health who hasn't necessarily had a mental ill health condition, yeah. it's really hard for them to know what works for them. Um, so I'm involved in another project um, with a business called Better Space which is um, the best way to describe it is a marketplace for mental well-being solutions that helps people and organizations work out what is good for them um, because they, a lot of people haven't had to go through that discovery process that you and I have had to do so to, to manage our mental well-being. But for the best world in the world, sometimes we do ignore it because of our passion and we've got to be mindful of that, I think. I think we do. Um... Do you think people need a rock bottom, though? Do you think they need to, to crash or have an illness or have a, it doesn't have to be an illness or a diagnosis, but like you might lose someone or so, you know, be close to burnout, like those sorts of things that just make you wake up to actually learn, understand and begin to practice stuff? Or can the human race actually be smart enough um, to, to invest, to, to just understand and invest in their bodies and minds before needing to go through some of the stuff we've been through? 
Uh, I think the answer is yes, the human race can do that. We've done that with physical health. That's um, true. We, you don't yeah, need don't, an injury in order to... Yeah. There's, a big, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big problem of inactivity out there, but I don't think that that's through lack of knowledge. So you know, that whole um, evolution of you know, the fitness industry and the gym memberships, and you know, people know that we should be exercising more. They also know now we should be eating less sugar generally. So I think we're, we're about to go through that revolution in preventative mental well-being. Um, so I think people need to understand and organizations are starting to understand what are the benefits for proactively looking after your mental well-being. And the, it, it creates happier people for sure, but it will also create more productive people. And we can also, I believe, reduce the burden on the health systems of this world by stopping people falling into the need to go into uh, um, or crisis recovery services. solutions. Crisis services. Um, yeah. So I think there's a big educational program, and that's kind of one of the things we're working at here on, on, on Better Space, is helping everybody become more literate about proactively looking after mental well-being. What would you say is your biggest challenge at the moment? My biggest challenge is actually time um, and the resource to fully capitalize on the opportunities that I see I can do, I can work on from inside out and, and, and where we go forward from here. So we've published the first leaderboard of 42 role models. We now have a great opportunity to take that into businesses, to grow that, that leaderboard, to take it globally, to um, you know, to to really make a difference. Um, so for me, it's making sure I maximise that opportunity, and, and I need more time and resource to do that. So the greatest challenge, I think, is 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 not messing all that up. <laughs> Don't fuck it up, Rob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you said you, you, you said it for me. Yeah, I, said I, it for I don't me. swear. I, I don't swear on, on, on stuff like that. Like you put the words into my mouth. I thought I could see them wanting to come out. Um, and they did. <laughs> um, another a challenge for me as an entrepreneur with all this excitement and so many amazing opportunities is to decipher the good from the excellent, um, the exciting from the ones that fit me and where I can have the best impact and learning to say no to the things that are going to end up burning me out because I can't say, I can't save the whole world. I want to, um, how are you at saying no or figuring that out? It's really hard. It's hard, isn't it? We're, we're, we're in the industry where we want to help people. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've, I am experiencing this at the moment because because of the success of the campaign that yeah. followed the Inside Our Leaderboard launch, um, I, I, I'm not even able to physically respond to everybody that sent me messages. And I, and I will get to it. I will catch up. But for me, that is really hard because if people take the time to offer you help or comment on what you're doing, I like to respond to that. Um, and I've, I've realized I've just got to be very brutal with what I say yes to. Um, and it also, it's got to be really on mission and it's got to be taking things forward. So if people are watching this and have contacted me and haven't got a response from me, I apologize. And it's not because I'm ignoring people. It's because of the success of what has happened. I just don't have the, the bandwidth to respond to everybody that has commented or, or, or offered you know, help with what I'm doing. Um, and that's a nice problem to have, but it's not one that sits very well with me. But I, yeah, I was having a conversation with somebody this morning who wanted to refer me to just help a business that you know are doing good stuff in the financial well-being space, and I had to say no because if I said yes to all of them, I wouldn't do the day job. Absolutely, we do have to say no where possible. Um, but it's also interesting that I'll go through a phase of, of business and figure out my well-being stuff as balance to that phase of it, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, like you're saying, you get some success or you change um, your, your direction a little bit based on something, your intuition, whatever's going on. You're now in a different level or a different space. And it, I now have to catch up and adjust my kind of mental health kind of prevention stuff to fit this new routine. And I feel like that's the constant challenge that's different than like a nine to five. You know, yeah, but I think that is life. Yeah, life is constantly changing, and we we need to accept that everything does change. So 
I think it's a lot easier to think of this in physical fitness terms. So your physical fitness is never constant. You will be stimulating your fitness by training. You'll then adapt to recover and, and get fitter. You might have a few days off. It goes down. And life might get in the way. Then you, Or you might have some events that, that really boost your fitness. And it's the same with our mental well-being. Yeah, there are a lot of influences on mental well-being. And there are a lot of influences on life. Life. and it is always evolving and so as soon as we get it in balance for one period you're right something can change uh, it could be positive could be negative could be just change and we've got to adapt to it and i think we've got to think of it as flexible and so you know the word resilience is around flexibility rather than strength i think it's often misconstrued yeah if we have the resilience to adapt to that change we then adjust our routines and we cope but we also need to be kind to ourselves because we're not going to get it right all the time, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, um, but we need that self-awareness to know when we are not getting it right as right as we should and think, okay, this is all right for now, but if you carry on like this, then you're going to burn out. So what, what do you need to change? How can you do it? And I think you're right. If we can fit in self-reflection time, space, whether that's a walk, whether that's a journaling, morning routine, talking to a friend, whatever that might be, that allows us those moments to adjust and to say, yeah. well, for this period of time, I need, like for me at the moment, I need yoga and I need walks around big, nice trees that I can hug, you know? Yeah. Um, I need a city break every once in a while just to get yeah. nature and air in me. Yeah. There's other times where I just want to kickbox and I want to like meet loads of people and just get loads of ideas going and that really fills me up. And so being able to adjust that, that it's not a one size fits all, um, but that we can ad adapt to whatever is going on. Um, yeah. So what's the, what's the big dream? You've, you've talked about lots of things, but where, where are you hoping uh, inside out and, and even you as a person, like what's the impact you want to create in the world over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, it's a good. It's a good question. I think Inside Out is it, it, it's quite interesting because if Inside Out is ultimately successful, it, it will no longer global, be required. Right? Yeah, fair point. Fair point. Okay. So that's not going to happen to next year or the year after. No. Stigma is still a problem we need to break down. So for me, I want to see the leaderboard grow. So we had 42 business leaders effectively this year. I'd like to see that at 70 next year. Um, I, we're also going to introduce lists or leaderboards for government, public sector, uh, ministers, MPs. So good. Uh, we're going to introduce leaderboards for the charity sector. Um, and Edu then we're education? going to introduce. Education sector? Yeah, education as well. Um, we're then going to introduce leaderboards for sports professionals and entertainers. And the reason I'm bringing those two categories in is because I've seen the power of collective social media activity. And if we can get to some more higher profile celebrities in there, it'll push it all up. Um, so that's the UK. And then I want to see leaderboards globally in, in, in other territories. But the, the real success of it would be in 10 years time, maybe it will be pointless to have a leaderboard because people are being so open about their mental ill health on boards and at all levels in companies, that the leaderboard is redundant. That is the vision. That's the win, um, right? Yeah. Um, so it might be 10 years, it might be 15. Um, but if I can play that small role in helping facilitate that, then Inside Out has done its job. So amazing. And um, I'm sure you've spoken in other parts of the world. And I was recently in the States and realized that as much as we get frustrated with some of the UK systems still, there's a long way to go across the globe. And so sure. I feel like we're able to, to pilot and test some amazing yeah. tools around transparency and good mental health, both personally and professionally, and just begin to grow that out. And I want to live in a world where human connection is a priority, where, where yeah. we look out for each other in that way, because I think it would solve a hell of a lot of problems. Oh, my goodness, Rob. I think we could we could talk all day, and I know we're going to we keep it. bumping into each other in, in our mental health circles. So I look forward to that. Um, until then, where can people find you? What's the best website or, or LinkedIn? What, how can people find you? Yeah, get, get me on LinkedIn. So Rob, Rob Stevenson on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I post most of my kind of thought leadership or inspirational stuff or even just my own journey with my own condition to let people know what it's like. Um, and then from a website point of view, inside-out.org. Uh, um, those, those two channels are the best. 
perfect. We'll add all that into the show notes. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Great to be here.